Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for sticking it out with us. Uh, I hate to be between you and the reception party. Um, so we're here today to, uh, to talk about kind of the convergence of education and learning uh, and media. Uh, and that actually just poses the first question, which is we're, we're, we consider ourselves educators and we're here at a, a media summit. So why, why do you think we're here, right? Uh, I'll take a crack at that. So um, my company, Medan, and Medan Labs, our software development arm, has been working on next generation platforms for engaging global students. Um, as we've seen, or as we've heard over the last day and a half, um, media is moving into conversations. Um, we think education is also moving in this direction. So our classroom to classroom platform is a conversational uh, tool that allows classrooms uh, of Portuguese speakers in Brazil, Arabic speakers in Doha, and English language speakers in the US and UK uh, to engage in conversations. So from my point of view, it's this global conversation that's starting that, that will be a part of uh, an open education ecosystem uh, in, the, in the coming years. And you know, so I'm thrilled to be here, happy uh, for a second year, and, uh, and uh, happy to see uh, Abu Dhabi interested in, in what's new in education. Yeah, actually for us, we look at um, media, education, uh, and innovation as a complementing and complementary ecosystem where each one, you know, media has always been there to entertain people, to engage with people in a certain way traditionally so far. And then you've got the educators and the educational systems which focus on, you know, building curriculums, education, you know. So we see ourselves as part of that, you know, all of us as digital, you know, innovators coming in and, and, and enabling that system and complementing that whereby we bring the best of you know, education or the core of education and availing that in a way that's you know, combining the education and entertainment. Uh, but today I think one of the, the key components is interactivity and engagement, right? So throughout the whole morning we were talking about you know, interactivity, engagement being not you know, one, one way uh, media, and I think the same applies for education. So we look at, you know, and, and over the past few months, for us at LAMSA specifically, we're focusing uh, on, on kids' edutainment. So there are the traditional media uh, providers who's, who have been, you know, able to kind of talk to children and give them entertainment for many years now. And there are the educational systems. So we've been kind of working as an innovation company to glue all of that together and give the, uh, give the media companies uh, a way for them to interact with uh, the consumer who is now spending time on the digital world as well, uh, but then with, within a certain level of educational standards, which we work closely with in uh, educational bodies, uh, be it some of the you know, uh, content, content providers in education, the, the, the ministries in some of the GCC countries. So we actually look at it as a complementing uh, ecosystem. Uh, now, in some of the regions here, we find a lot of people kind of developing ecosystems rather than ecosystems, where each one's concerned about his own kind of you know, ego, but then we try to break that and kind of develop uh, a system where it's win-win for everyone. No one is trying to step on anyone's ego or stuff. We, we kind of always call out for developing these uh, healthy ecosystems whereby each one benefits from this relationship. So uh, I am certainly the odd man out on uh, today's entire conference uh, uh, because I am not in a media company at all. In fact, um, I am probably the antithesis of a media company. I'm starting a uh, brand new university. In fact, this is the first Ivy caliber university in the United States launched in over 100 years. Uh, 
but the reason I think that they asked somebody as out there as me to come uh, to this conference is that I am an example of the kind of institution that gets built when all of you do the job we expect you to do. And the job that we expect you to do isn't the job that you've been doing so far. It actually takes the definition of media to a different level. So as an example, in our university, we will not offer a single introductory level course in any subject. In fact, we won't even offer some advanced courses in certain subjects, courses that are effectively knowledge dissemination because we believe that the world of media, the world of adaptive learning, where media and technology merge, will do a far better job than an in-person or small format classroom. And so the challenge that we have for the folks on the stage, for people like edX, for people in the media world, is not just to think about the new world of media as to how do you continue to deliver what you've been delivering but in a different format, but actually how to evolve and look at new markets and new opportunities to enable better transfer of information such that the institutions that have non-media presence, the ones that actually are, in our case, developing the intellect of the individual student that can pay attention to that development on uh, a small format basis, 15, 19 students at a time, can pick up where you leave off and effectively redefine the institution. All right, thanks. Um, I have uh, kind of three points to our discussion, and we have a little over 20 minutes to, to get through them, so I'll just introduce them uh, to the audience here. Uh, the, first is, uh, the first is the process of going digital, of digitization. Education is actually behind, way behind media here, but is going to have to go through a catch-up process in partnership with media organizations. Uh, the second is the process of regionalization and localization. Uh, and then the third is what kind of new business models might we see uh, emerge, what's working, what's in the future. Um, and there are two overall themes. Uh, the first is this disruptive access to learning media and learning experiences. Um, and how that's going to transform the world. Uh, the second is how our existing human institutions are having to adapt. So whether it's universities or multinational corporations, everyone's having to adapt. Um, and speaking of which, uh, the, the, the question that I think it, you know, comes to mind is we've seen media organizations move into education. We've seen educational organizations move into media. So, you know, News Corp has bought a wireless generation and is investing hundreds of millions into owning tablet experiences. Pearson has acquired the Financial Times, The Economist. The New York Times acquired Epsilon. And Washington Post, for a long time, only made money on Kaplan and has sold off the Washington Post and is now just Kaplan. So uh, the question is, are, are, are we confused about what business we're, we're in? Should media be in education? Should education be in media? What's going on here? Yeah, so for us, we, okay, these international transactions are happening. We see these different players and different giants trying to get into different businesses. But at the end of the day, for us, it's about the consumer, right? Uh, what does the, in, in LAMSA specifically, it's about the digital child, right? and understanding that child, and understanding what value we can deliver to that child. And it needs to be very contextual to the region that we're in, to the values that we want to deliver, um, to what are the standards that we want to apply. So for us, you know, we've been going to the, we've been working with the various ecosystem players. One of them is the media company. So we go to media companies and we say, we've got you know, this digital platform which allows you to talk to the digital child. And that's when the process kicks in. So a lot of these media companies, the traditional ones, uh, see that they're kind of losing uh, some of their consumers to the, towards the digital world. And we come in as a, as a way to complement them and work together with them in, in developing, you know, using their content, uh, using their assets and their know-how with, the, with, the, with, the, with children specifically, but bringing that into, into the digital world in an interactive way. And, it, and it's a joint activity. So... Uh, but we bring in the expertise and how, you know, the usability, the interactivity, and, and, but we also work closely with them. So right now we kind of 
work with most of the Arabic uh, media uh, developers for kids, and we've kind of brought that experience online, right? Yeah. But, um, uh, let me kind of add a thought-provoking question there, which is that, you know, the most successful education media organization is Khan Academy, and it's a nonprofit, and by his own account, it's free, and it sucks. There's no production <laughs> value, there's no, and, uh, and uh, you know, we also see a lot of the successful uh, MOOCs, the uh, online courseware, things like that, mainly use the professor's butt model of media production, which is they film the professor at the, at the lecture board, and it's free, and it's run by nonprofits. So um, is content actually an asset? Does there need to be production value? How do you add value on top of that content? How do you preserve the value of content? I think it's about value. I mean, the moment, uh, the key here is delivering value, and um, it's very important. It, once you deliver value to the child, then it's a matter of just you know, sustaining that, that value and delivering more and more value. So Khan Academy, you mentioned that as an example. I mean, every time you go in, you can learn something, right? And, mm -hmm. and you, whether, regardless of the quality of it, regardless of, the, the format of it, but you learn something. For us, the value has been, you know, the local and culturalization has been very, very key to us. So there are all these international players, but then when coming to the region, understanding what the region needs, understanding the customization, the localization. So everybody from outside looks at the region as one whole region, but then when you dig down and you, deep in the region, you find that, that you know, when you want to offer something in Arabic, you cannot assume that the Arabic is one language. There are different dialects, there are different regions, there are different... So we kind of work very closely in, in customizing it, localizing, understanding the consumer, understanding what they need at this point of time. Mm -hmm. And also when it comes to the culture and being very sensitive to the culture. So, um, you know, you've got these international themes that are delivered for, for, for children, but then not necessarily everything relates to the region. So we, that's actually one of the main triggers that got us into this business was that, you know, as, as, a, as a young parent, I saw my children growing up and they didn't have access. So there were a lot of English and, and, and French and international uh, apps and platforms, but then we didn't find something of good quality which is for the region. And that's what triggered this whole thing. So I, I want to wait get this point in before the uh, president of edX shows up, um, which is um, in, as, as we're looking for new business models in this, in this environment, um, it, it's important to look at what uh, Coursera is doing. Um, and Medan is really proud to be working with uh, the Tagradat community to translate Coursera uh, content into Arabic. And the first full Coursera course, uh, just uh, uh, 32 hours of video has been uh, fully translated into Arabic and will be released soon. So um, what's interesting is Coursera, free university level ed education, anyone can sign up. Um, four million users around the world are now registered with Coursera. Mm -hmm. Investors are lining up behind yeah, them. Thank you. We're investors in Coursera. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so plug yeah. for Coursera. Yeah. And, and I think the, the business model, like much of the, the digital media ecosystem, um, let's not worry about the business model because we've got four million eyeballs behind this. And, <laughs> and, and we're getting momentum. The business model will sort itself out. If we get 20 million people onto this platform and we're delivering, I think they have 80 universities now signed up on Coursera. So if we're able to deliver education to the world, there's, there's probably a business model in there. And you're sure. gonna get smart investors who are gonna say, yeah, we'll give this some time. And, and uh, if, I, if I could jump yeah. in. The, um, so, you know, I can't speak for Coursera, though we are investors. Um, you know, right now their main theory around business model and monetization is providing a certificate layer. So they have, yeah. a, um, they have a signature track, which they basically ask people to pay for, a certain percentage pay for it. Uh, so their theory is that there's kind of a credentialing layer of value add on top of content, and that you can literally just charge and people will literally get out their credit cards. Uh, you know, Bader from Lamsa, you mentioned 
that the point of value add, the point of value creation is regionalization, localization, adapting to local cultures. But you, what, your primary business is in adapting to, to, to yeah, the our, region our, and localization, right? Our bread and butter is doing the software that enables crowds to come behind translation problems. Um, we express that in education, uh, doing projects like Coursera. But I, I think there's an interesting model for the region here. There's a need to create the, the number that's generally thrown around is 30 million jobs. So there's a need to create 30 million jobs. So how does the open global education ecosystem, the fact that all this content is freed up, how does this actually impact the sort of trainings needed to create jobs? And I think that's when, when you're looking for the business opportunity, the business opportunity in open education comes when you get that story of the guy who's put together the recipe that's trained engineers that are now making you know, good wages because they went through this course of study. And I think that's, that's the end point, that's, that's the real kind of proof point for open education. So, so I, I wanna actually take a little bit of a different tactic on this from your perspective, right? Because you're in the media business and you've just gone through about a decade of extraordinarily painful lesson in, in uh, microeconomics. Right, where you learn that the, when the marginal cost of delivery of a product is asymptotically close to zero, your marginal revenue will, approach as, will asymptotically get to zero. And you go through it in part after part of the media industry, of course, most notably in music and now in news, soon in, uh, in broadcast, et cetera, and you are forced to switch. Right? You're forced to pivot. And so the record labels get into live entertainment, right? which is where uh, your business models are. But you have an opportunity now to do that to a different sector, right? So, so what is the Arab term, a tachles, bottom line, right? Uh, think about uh, uh, some, of this, uh, uh, some of this data. So it, in the University of California system, um, there are 95,000 students a year that take Psychology 101. Now that's one state just in the United States, one course. Because those students don't pay, wind up paying uh, as much money, they only pay about a third as much money as a traditional university uh, in the United States, with, but there are some out of state that pay full fare, that's about a $200 million business. Okay, $200 million, one course, one state, one set of institutions. It's not everybody in the state that takes Psych 101, it's just that institution, right? Now you think about it in other states, people taking it in private universities, paying three times as much, that one course generates billions of dollars of revenue, and it involves billions of dollars of cost. You in the media business can produce the world's greatest psycholo Psychology 101 class by a mile, something that no professor could possibly reproduce. It'll cost you a million dollars? If you go absolutely you know, gung-ho about it, <laughs> maybe two million? And you can address a global two or three billion dollar market if you, find, if you figure out the certification problem. Now you can do that for Econ 101, Econ 102, you can do it for dozens, if not hundreds of courses. Right, multi-billion dollar opportunity that right now isn't addressed by anyone who has any kind of media sense. So right? you're trying to provoke the media into disrupting the education. Absolutely. I think you should okay. look at a $20 billion market and, and think hard about how you make that $20 billion market into <laughs> a $2 billion market and own it. And just, just to add to that, just to add to that, once you've got something which is successful, I don't think you need to worry about the business model. I think if you can deliver something that is needed by consumers, someone will pay for it, either the consumer or someone else, a brand or someone, you know, we're talking about, you know, donations, someone will pay for it. So I think, I think worrying about the business model too much, just make sure it works and then someone will... Yeah, and, and, and you can well, see, I mean, in, our, in the keynote yesterday, you heard the guy from Disney talking about how Disney is doing an education business in China. And I was in China uh, a month ago and uh, talking to people about innovation in education, first 
word that came out of people's mouth, Disney uh, English learning. And so what he was saying wasn't just a corporate pitch. It was what people on the ground in China are looking to for excellence in education. Guess what? A media company came into China and is providing the best education instruction because they're bringing a media sensibility and the business is doing great. And English education is like a $50 billion a year market. That's right. Um, and rapidly growing in China. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, one thing that kind of came up, uh, uh, certainly between you, Ed, and, and Ben, is, is the tyranny of the course format, right? Mm -hmm. And the course is like an epically long documentary movie format, right? And the people that were just on, on stage were saying, we don't have to think about media in 60 minute and 30 minute increments anymore, right? We can hack the format. Uh, and uh, I participated in something, I, I think it was on Forbes, I hope I'm not getting it wrong, but it was uh, the 30-second the MBA. And it was just business <laughs> leaders saying business tips in 30 seconds or less, the 30-second MBA. Um, so what kind of formats can we look forward to, right, uh, besides a course? Let's, let's think outside the course. Well, I mean, we, we see a number of different formats out there. We think the dominant format will actually be time independent but competency oriented when it comes to the media part of, of education. And so, you know, you, you see adaptive learning platforms like Newton, K-N-E-W-T-O-N, um, who, if you believe what they say, and there's no reason not to, um, if you have a million students taking a Newton course within an hour, no two of the million will have had the same experience because the algorithm that sees how they answer questions, how long it takes them to answer, what they get wrong, what aspects will modify their path to teach them an optimal level. Now, they do that initially with math, but they can do it, frankly, with any subject and knowledge dissemination, where I think the course will actually survive and Minerva is a traditional university and we do offer our classes in courses because 100% of our classes are small format seminars under 19 students and they explore subjects to which there is not necessarily a single answer. The primary purpose of this course is the individual socially oriented intellectual development of the students, which means that you need to spend time with expert and student in a small group format Synchronously. And for that, a course is an arbitrary measurement of time, but you know, you can divide it into two sessions, three sessions, five sessions, that doesn't matter. But you want to have the synchronous presence. Whereas for most knowledge dissemination, you don't need to do that. So I I I, I tend to see, and, and this might not be realistic, but um, if you want to play out the what what we're seeing in media and this this kind of the conversational or the citizen journalist tour, turn that, 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 that's happening in the, in the media landscape, we take that into education. We might imagine that future courses look a lot less like the sage on the stage uh, or, 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 or you know, the, the professor at the chalkboard and, and a lot more like a distributed network of 300,000 students all of whom might be better positioned, or one of whom might be better positioned to address conversationally uh, one student's learning need. So we start to get the kind of learner-teacher role that I think in any healthy education system, inverting the role of the learner-teacher is really important. And it's certainly, you know, we care a lot about global literacies and global education. And so when Cutter Foundation International uh, supported us to build out classroom to classroom, they were really focused on like not, not how do we teach kids about environmental science, but how do we allow these you know, students from around the world to teach each other. So I think if, if, you know, it's a slightly utopian vision of education and maybe not something that really fits with higher ed, but I think in general, evolving the course, evolving education to a point where students are, are feeling empowered to teach each other and are, you know, make, where, where the insights of, you know, uh, one student are benefiting all. So, okay. uh, I, th I think, uh, talking about formats, I think one of the best uh, examples about, you know, education and information on apps is uh, an app called Back in Time, if you've heard of that. 
Mm. So Back in Time is a very interesting app which takes all of the encyclopedias, history, uh, everything, and just puts it in one app in a visual way to see the entire encyclopedia information in, in a form of a 24-hour kind of uh, time zone. And you yeah. can just flip throughout history. And, and, and that's a form of really you know, looking at how to bring boring or like traditional encyclopedia stuff and making it engaging and interactive and really out there. It's, uh, it's a form of, you know, uh, you can play around with information and, and whatever is something of interest to you will stick to your mind. Mm -hmm. So I think it's unlimited. You talked about formats. I think, I think the avenue for unlimited format with the technologies that we're using is just limited to what we can think of. And uh, Bader, your uh, uh, Lamsa is uh, subscription based, right? Yeah. And uh, and the content is uh, short video. Is that the format or? So we we target and work with kids. So as you know, um, most of you know, kids are multitasking. They do ten zillion things at the same time. So we kind of cater for different formats. So um, we we provide uh, interactive stories, but videos as well, games, coloring, so the entire range of, of um, edutainment needs of a child. Mm -hmm. And the way that we do that, our content is consumed uh, more than uh, 2.5 million downloads on, on content. We've got about uh, 250,000 kids using it, and, and we're able to kind of you know, uh, monitor their behavior and see what they're doing and, and, and what they're doing more, what they're doing less and we're able to kind of you know, give them more of what they like. And the way that um, the business model works is that kids have access to free content, but then to get the full kind of advantage of, of and, and, and the features and the content, they kind of need to upgrade um, the functionality by, uh, by going for a subscription model. And as most of you know, in the region, we have a problem with the, with the payment. So we've kind of worked together with, closely with mobile operators. And we still, so in each country that we enter in uh, the region, we, we choose a strategic mobile operator to kind of be our distribution arm for payment and, and, uh, and collection. And uh, that's been doing well for us. Mm -hmm. The, the parents pay business model is a tried and true in the learning space. Uh, the, parents, the parents at this point of time before kids go to school feel the need to kind of educate their kids or give them as much leverage as possible uh, before they, they go to school. Once they go to school, they feel a bit more relaxed. You know, someone else can take care of their education. But then we all want the kids to be ready before they go to school and have a heads up. So that's when you know, Sesame, Sesame Street workshop have done uh, a large research, and that's where parents really spend the most amount of money on their kids, is, is in the toddlers, preschoolers stage. So it's, there's a big opportunity in that. That's great. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, ask the audience if they have a question or two uh, before we have to wrap up. Uh, does anybody have any questions before the timer? Hello. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask about the. Uh, reputation of the Coursera model. How do you think this can be processed in, in our region? Do you think there is a future for that? Do you think it can work? Thank you. Uh, yeah, and we're about to be visited by uh, the, the CEO of edX, so we'll have stuff to say about there as well, but while you guys are up here. I think you're the best one. Uh, yeah. 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 He Mina. just air buys, sorry, he just air buys the first Coursera co uh, course. Yeah. So I, I think that it's, it's going to be demand driven, but if uh, past interest in Coursera and Udacity uh, offerings in the region are any indicator, I think that as we start to localize, um, translate more of this content, that, that there will be an appetite for it. I mean, this, I think especially in the computer science uh, and and uh, and and sciences, uh, it's, it's very high quality content. The problem that we still have with this is um, the interactivity. So we can we can translate the videos, but what would it mean to really run an interactive course where students in the region were able to 
you know, inter interact with their counterparts or with the professor. Um, and, and that's not just a cross-language issue, that's kind of a MOOC issue in general, is, is how, you know, how, how do we engage more interaction? And you know, the, the MOOCs can look like a solution to global education, and they may be that, but, but um, you know, it's still very early days on, on these courses. And, and uh, you know, one interesting point of feedback is my brother's a university professor and he taught his first MOOC uh, last year. He's like, oh, I hated that. It was awful. <laughs> like I didn't get to talk to my, I didn't get that you know, sense that I was teaching. I was, I was uh, it, you know, it really lost that. So I think that, that high touch, the kind of human component of, of education is, is always gonna be important. And, and uh, you know, certainly as we export this stuff to the region, it'll be important that this stuff gets instructed in classrooms and gets picked up by university professors here and, and uh, so. So, so let, let me just address the question you asked about, about will it get the, the credibility? So the, the, the whole MOOC movement got into gear and got public attention when uh, Sebastian Thrun offered his artificial intelligence class at Stanford, and 23,000 people completed the course online that he taught to 200 students at, at Stanford. But the more interesting factor for me was that of the 200 students that were enrolled in his class at Stanford that could go and sit and listen to him lecture. And Sebastian is not just a random university professor, he's kind of a celebrity, right? I mean, he's like at Google, and he hangs out with the governor, and with the you know, presidents, and all the rest. So, they, so those students actually had access to him, right? 180, 175 of the 200 never showed up to class. They decided they'd prefer to take his course on a platform that didn't exist, on the, on the, the <laughs> alpha version. Right, the worst possible technology you could you could imagine <laughs> delivering a course on, right? Because it wasn't it was before you'd asked that he was graded, rather than actually sit through the lecture, right? So they say that distance learning starts in the third row. So I can basically see that basically behind the third row, everybody's on their phone, and everybody in the first three rows wasn't smart enough to sit back the there so they could be on their phones. The third row, right? <laughs> um, and so uh, and so what what the the difference is that universities will not be able to continue performing business as usual. They won't be able to say, oh yes, for the 23,000 of you, for anybody in the world that wants to take our courses, it's totally free, except for those students that get admitted to our university, in which case it'll be $5,000 a piece. That's, there's no way they're gonna be able to sustain that. So what's gonna happen is that the nature of these courses will change. And so the, these courses that will be, be able to be delivered en masse will be, and they will be considered public domain and public access over time, right? And the value of those courses will be the same whether they're delivered within the institution or outside the institution. The market will force that to happen. There won't be a choice but for the courses to have the same value. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but that was a miraculous transition to our <laughs> next guest, actually. Um, are we ready to go? Yeah? So what do we do? <laughs> we, we wrap up. Okay. So you guys are up. Everybody thank Ben, Ed, and Butter. Thanks, guys. <laughs>